Hi guys, welcome back to our um, next episode of uh, I Keep Pulling It For Your Mind but Wellbeing series. Um, so today we've got Nanda um, on today. Uh, she's a physiotherapist and she's going to be talking about living with ulcerative colitis and its impact on mental health. So Nanda, over to you. If you could just give us a dis- brief description about yourself first and then we'll go from there. Thanks. It's lovely being here. Um, so yeah, my name is Nanda. I am a physiotherapist. Um, I'm a private physiotherapist, so I have my own business, my own clinic, um, and I see patients at my clinic. Um, I have ulcerative colitis, which I've now had since 2008, so I think it's probably been about 12 or 13 years. Um, it's, it's been a, quite a journey. Um, it's Basically, it's an inflammatory bowel disease, so it's a condition that you can't cure you just have to learn to manage it um, using medicine or lifestyle um, and anything else that helps and basically it's a condition that affects your bowels so you know how like how you get ulcers in your mouth I would get them in my colon so that's what ulcerative colitis is it's ulcers in the colon Um, and it's it's quite a it's a tough disease to have Um, there is so inflammatory bowel disease there's another one called Crohn's disease so you might be quite familiar with that one so this is the other one of that um and basically the symptoms are anything to do with digestion so things like going to the toilet quite a lot um you know stomach pain um nausea um and anything where if if I'm trying to eat certain foods I won't be able to digest them or absorb that food so I find like getting nutritional um, value from food is very difficult. Um, so yeah, that's that's what ulcerative colitis is. Okay, you just you've mentioned um, you know what it is and um, some of the symptoms that you kind of have to deal with. Um, how does it like impact your day? So if you've got like you know obviously you're seeing patients or clients, um, and you've said you know sometimes you you've, you've got to go and that's it kind of thing. So how do you kind of plan your day and how do you kind of work around that? Yeah, it's, it's been tough. Um, when I first started, I thought to myself, how am I going to work? Because I was really, really sick at that time. And I would be going to the toilet like, I don't know, 20 to 30 times a day. And that's a lot. Um, and I think when I first started, I was kind of like, uh, how am I going to go to the toilet halfway through a session? What's that going to look like to a client? It's not going to look very good. Um, so I used to be quite anxious about it. But as I went along and I got used to seeing patients, I started to be a little bit more sort of forward with them. So whenever I get a new patient now, I will tell them I've got ulcerative colitis, uh, which means that sometimes I do halfway through your session, I'm just going to say, I'm really sorry, but I need to go to the loo. And then I'll just go and then I'll come back and I'll give them their time back and nobody has a problem with it. So it's more just about being honest um, so that whenever I do need to go, I will go. Um, and I do try to try to plan like when I eat and stuff, like I try to plan um, my lunches so that I can eat and then have some time afterwards. So if I do need to go to the toilet before a patient, I can do it. But also um, I get really, really tired. So I get a lot of fatigue from colitis. So I can't see as many patients a day as a normal physiotherapist would. Um, so my, my day kind of looks like between four to five patients a day, six max if I'm feeling really good. Um, and I have a lot of a lot of break between them as well. So I don't see them back to back. There's a good hour break between them. So I can just rest. I can just have some water, have something to eat and just kind of let my body rest. So just about taking breaks and just being honest about it as well. Cool. And you mentioned um, obviously certain foods you've got to avoid. Um, is there anything that in terms of food whites, is there anything that helps or um, there's nothing like that at all? Um, yeah, so it took, again, it took me years to figure that out. Um, so with, with colitis, you get flare-ups and you get remissions. So when you're in a flare-up, your symptoms are at their worst. You get, you have to go to the toilet loads and loads of times. So for me, it's like 20 times a day. Um, if I have a flare-up, I have lots of pain, lots of tiredness. And then my diet is different during the flare-up. So I'd be eating things like um, anything that can lessen your fiber. So it's the opposite to healthy food. So it's white food. So like white bread, white rice, toast, crackers, things like that. Um, And yeah, it's just not very nutritious. But when I'm in remission and I'm better, 
Um, I can eat a lot more, but even still, like even now I'm quite well and I'm in remission, but I struggle to eat like fruit and veg. So anything that's raw or anything that most people would find something that your body has to work a little bit harder to digest the raw things like raw carrots, um, cucumbers, fruit, apples, bananas. Those things are, are, are harder for me to eat. So I tend to stay away from them. I tend to eat like cooked vegetables. Um, and then also, so things like obviously in our diet, we have a lot of curries and stuff. So I can't have anything that's really, really spicy or has too much um, like masala in it. So like lots of spices and lots of flavor. It's a bit too much for my body. So I tend to eat a lot of bland type foods and that tends to help quite a lot. Anything you can find that helps you to irritate your colon less, that's what helps basically. And um, I know you already kind of said, um, you know, when you're, uh, how you do it, how you deal with it during patients, when you're seeing them on your day, your working day, and I know you, you do work out, um, how do you deal with it in terms of that, or does it, I'm assuming it still would make an impact on your um, routine or your workout routine, um, so how would you deal with it there? Yeah, that's really difficult. Um, I've been struggling with that for years now because I am a very active, sporty person. And I was like that um, until I got diagnosed. So I was diagnosed when I was, I must have been about 17 or 18. Um, and at school, I just used to play lots of sports. I used to work out and do everything that was active. Um, and then I got diagnosed and I was sick for about three or four years where probably longer than that, where I just could, I couldn't even walk down the stairs and walk to the kitchen let alone do any sort of exercise um and so that happens quite a lot with with my flare-ups I still get flare-ups randomly here and there and those flare-ups knock me back quite a lot where I can't even walk sort of five minutes down the road let alone even try to think about working out or you know seeing patients and stuff like that um I think I think it, it's it's hard um Finding, finding a, a, a time in my remission when I know that I'm not going to overdo it and make myself really tired and then therefore not be able to see my patients. It's a hard, hard balance for me to find. Um, and I think what I try to do is I try to pace my activities. And by activities, I mean, like, I have to really think about what I'm doing. So let's say, for example, if I walk from my house to this clinic, that's an activity for me so that travel in the morning if I do that and then see four patients a day it's really difficult for me um even though it's only a 10 minute walk but I've tried it and I find that it just really knackers me out and it affects how I treat patients and and how because obviously you have to have energy to be able to see patients and obviously I work quite hands-on as well um so little things like that I try to think about what type of activities I'm doing through the day and just try to pace things or make things a little bit easier so that I can do things like working out um, instead but it's it's about finding a balance and and sometimes I get to a place where I'm I've gone I've done a bit too much and then I'm completely knackered and I'm knackered for like two weeks I have to rest and just completely stop everything which just, again affects your muscle gain so it's really, really being careful about pacing your activities and really thinking about what your body is feeling like. Yeah, brilliant. So you've talked about like um, physically, um, you know, how it's impacted and the changes you've had to make. Um, but what about mentally? I know you mentioned a little bit, you touched a little bit about on it when you first, you know, when you first see a client, if it's a new client, um, you know, you felt, you felt a bit anxious telling them, but in terms of um, just mental, the mental side of it, how has it affected you there? Yeah, so um, my my journey, so I'll tell you like my personal journey and then how my clients come into it as well. So I've when I first got it, obviously it's a condition that just completely turns your life upside down. Um, and I, I struggled with GCSEs and A-levels because that was the time that I got it. And being that age and having to go to the toilet a million times a day, it's not a nice condition to have. Um, and... I developed a lot of like anxiety and depression during that time um, and the anxiety was sort of around like always wanting to make sure I had a toilet next to me um, figuring out 
how I would get from A to B without going to the toilet. Everything was just around where, 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 you know, basically, do I have a toilet there that I can go to in, in like five seconds if I need to, like urgently. So there was a lot of anxiety about going out and, you know, doing anything in life. So I built up a lot of anxious thoughts and feelings that still stay with me today because of this condition. So even though now I'm a lot better, I can control, um, you know, the urgency, I can, I can eat a lot more. I'm, I'm so much better, but I still have those thoughts. And sometimes I really do have to work on them and breathe through it because it, I know it's just my body reacting to what I've been through before. It's, it's a kind of reminder. Um, and yeah, and again, during that time when I first got diagnosed, I was quite depressed because it was the time when I was going through uni and going to uni as well. So kind of going through that and at that time thinking, how am I ever going to become a physiotherapist when I'm this sick? How am I even going to work if I can't even go to uni and, you know, just attend a lecture? Um, so I went through a lot of anxiety and depression at that time. Um, and I'm now at a point where the depression is not there anymore because I'm in a better place, a much, much better place. And I've been in that place for about a good four years now. So I've learned to deal with those feelings and the, the anxiousness as well. Um, and a part of that now, so my sort of new sort of challenge this over this last year was coming out and telling people that I have colitis. So in, in my professional life, everybody in my personal life knew all about it um but in my professional life on my instagram specifically um I ne i've never said anything about colitis and i've always wanted to try and sort of put the word out there that i do have it and i'd like to help other people to not feel alone so i just decided to put a post up to say i have colitis this is what i've been through and it was one of the best things i ever did because I had so many messages coming to me um, from people saying, you know, uh, I feel the same as you. I have this condition and, and you, you kind of have the same symptoms and the same type of journey. And it really opened up a whole new world for me. And the one thing that stopped me from doing it when I was thinking about doing it was if I tell people, if I tell my potential clients I have colitis, would it make them think that I'm not going to be... Um, as good a physiotherapist as somebody else that doesn't have a condition that makes them tired or you know sick um, but I actually found that people were more sometimes I find people are more likely to come to me because I understand what they're going through a little bit especially with pain um, so that's one of the biggest things that I just opened up is a lot of people I think find that because I've been through a journey myself I'm a bit more likely to understand their journey or just be a bit more empathetic about it. Um, so yeah, it's, just, it's, it's actually been a great, brilliant, amazing thing that I've done. Um, so yeah. Nanda, I just wanted to ask you, um, so what sort of coping mechanisms do you use? I know you said that you've, you know, over the last four years, your mental health improved. So, you know, if you were to speak to somebody else going through similar um similar problems what would you advise yeah um it's hard it's not easy um so i would probably advise them to probably do some breathing um so kind of like mindfulness meditation so conditions like mine or any sort of autoimmune conditions which which what my condition is it's all about your your body stressing itself out and when it stresses itself out that's when your symptoms happen so it's about trying to get your body to calm down and stop thinking that you know it, it's in a fight or flight mode all the time and that generally helps that's what your coping mechanisms would be um, to help your symptoms but also to help like your mental health around that condition as well so um, I found that using mindfulness and meditation helped a lot so that again, that was another big journey for me because it's not easy to get into. And I think when you first start, it's it's really hard to know what you're whether what you're doing is right or wrong. But I think for me, it was just making sure that I just didn't give up. I just kept finding different ways of doing it. Different, you know. There's so many apps out there. There's so many things on YouTube, and there's so many explanations of it now. 
um, just keep trying and try to find different ways of doing it. There's different types of mindfulness that you can do. Um, and then I think the other thing that helped me is looking, having a look at my life and seeing what, what, what I was doing in it and what was making me tired, what was, what was giving me sort of negative energy and tired energy rather than a positive energy. So for me, seeing, seeing like, I tried seeing nine to 10 patients a day and I managed it for about a month before my body caught up and was like, no, I'm not having this. So it's looking at what, what you're doing throughout the day and seeing what is draining your energy. And for me, unfortunately, even though I absolutely love my job, seeing nine to 10 patients a day was too much. So I looked at that and I, I had to do a bit of an experiment and figure out the right number for me so that I could make sure I can continue it without having to take two to three months off as a rest afterwards. That's great, thank you. Amanda, um, how did you find managing relationships? And that could be like friendships as well, because, you know, what made me think about that question was when you said about how, um, you know, like your family knew, and then the next stage was about the, the clients. So, it, it, you know, you, you, I think in terms of the answer to Sabrina's question, you know, you've done a lot in, because um, you have to be so adaptable, and you've done a lot in recognising what some of those key, I guess, contributing factors are to how you then manage yourself within that situation. Um, how, how have you managed relationships um, with, with, with this condition? And have you found that there's still a taboo or is it not like that? And, you know, how have you found that? Um, so when I first got diagnosed, um, I definitely think I lost a lot of friends. Um, because I wasn't able to go out, I wasn't able to socialize, I could barely leave my, my bedroom. So um, I think, I think in, in that sense, people probably don't understand how to help and what to do. And sometimes some people might think that, you know, do, do we give you sympathy or do we just say, oh, it's okay. And I was sick for a long, long time. It was a good four years where I was just consistently sick. So it's hard to be friends with someone that is sick like that. So, and, and it's harder when you don't know what to say to them and how to be a friend to them. Um, but what I found was that the friends that wanted to stay and wanted to make an effort um, with me, those are the ones that are the friends that I still have now. Um, and I think what helped was me opening up to them and just saying, look, this is the condition that I have. And I'm quite a jokey person, so I make a joke out of it, and I still do with my friends. Like they'll they'll always make sure that if we go on holiday or something, there's two bathrooms and one of the toilets is mine, um, or things like if we if we're going on a long drive or something like that, they'll they'll just know that okay, so we've got to make sure that there are toilet stops on the way. So they 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 support me in that way because they just know that I just need to go to the toilet. Like it's that simple, and I think. It's, it's the support that they can give me and the more open and honest I am about it, the easier it is for them to be friends with me because if I wasn't, if I wasn't to tell them that I need the toilet all the time, like I would just lose them. They wouldn't have no idea what to do. Um, it's the same with family. So again, with family, I think, I think it's harder with family, like especially being in an Asian family. Um, when I think when I first got diagnosed, my parents kind of pushed me towards, like I, I come from a family that sort of just stay strong. You, you know, there, there's no point being weak. You just got to be strong, get through it. And I think that kind of stuff doesn't really work um, when you're as sick as I was, and when you're just waiting for your body to naturally just start healing. It takes time sometimes, and sometimes you just have to, you know, sit in that horrible place and just be sick for a little while and let your body naturally heal um and I think yes I think my relationship with my family changed a lot once they understood what I was going through and what I knew I needed so as long as I opened up to them and said you know I I know 
I know what's good for me and, I, and you just need to let me do what's good for me. Don't, don't try and push like all these thermal remedies and a million different things to try. Um, I just know what works for my body and, and you just need to listen sometimes. You can't just push things on me and, and you know, force me in a certain direction. That's great, thank you. You mentioned um, about the herbal, um, herbal remedies. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to touch on it because um, as, as I'm sure Sabrina and um, Nisha should probably be agreeing with us here, but um, it's such a common thing within the Asian community. Any any problem you have and it's like straight away, let's get on to that. Um, and I'm sure that must have been um, something to kind of, as in like to say to your family, oh no, no, that stuff's not going to work. And obviously coming from a, um, from a background that you, you come from, um, there's that element as well. Um, have you had other people kind of push that kind of stuff as well, or is it just just been family? Um, it's mostly family. Um, I think you know. So I'm actually a big believer in Ayurvedic medicine because it actually works for me. Um, I actually went. So I still go every two years now. I go to Kerala and I get three weeks worth of, worth of treatment, um, and it just gives me like about two years worth of good health. Um, it's just something that I just use as a top up. But again, that took me a while to kind of try. And it's something that you have to try. And if it works for you, it works for you. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But um, yeah, I think it, is to, it was mostly my family. So it's, it's, it's Asian, older generation that sort of tried to push it on me. But the thing that they don't understand is, it, well, first of all, they didn't understand that, that how the condition works. Um, and that giving me something like um, turmeric, so hobby, if if I had that, I mean that you know for Asians that's like the cure all, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, but giving me something like that, so with my condition, actually heats up my body. It makes things worse, and it will make me go to the toilet more. It doesn't help, um, and it can only help in certain doses. And as long as you take other things with it, which is what I learned when I went to the Ayurvedic place. Because with Ayurvedic medicine, they would know better because they're, they're obviously, um, you know, they're learned in it, basically. They, they know what works together with what kind of herbs, rather than just like your mum saying, oh, here, take this. Like, you can't, you just can't do that sometimes. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, people do get a little bit pushy with it. And especially if it's worked for them, if they've had like a small stomach condition that's not colitis and they'll say, oh, it helped me. And I'm like, yeah, but mine's is colitis. It's a disease. Like I don't have inflammatory bowel syndrome or anything. It's it's an actual disease. So yeah, it's it's quite a big thing in the Asian community. Nanda, do you know of many people within the Asian community that have the same condition as you, and and how do they sort of deal with it? Have you spoken to them about it? Yeah. So since I've opened up, um, loads of people. I've realised how common it is. It's so 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 common. Um, lots of people in the Asian community have it. Um, I think I'm speaking to two or three at the moment through my Instagram that have it. Um, and they kind of find the same thing. They're sort of, so one of them is on, on an early journey, so they've just been diagnosed. And I think a, a lot of them do find that they do get pushed into trying herbal, herbal med remedies. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, and sometimes that, that can make it worse. So it's, it's really hard to know whether you should take it or not so yeah I just try to give them my kind of take on it and I'm like look if you want to try it and you feel like you want to try it you can but just be aware that not all all herbal stuff is going to be okay if you don't know how it's going to affect you unless someone is is um is licensed in it or not licensed but someone is a professional in it and has learned all about it and then they give it to you you can try that but just trying something that someone recommends to you you just don't know <laughs> and um you know obviously when you go to to functions and, and things like that i guess that has an effect on you as well obviously the, the the kind of diet that you need to have yeah yeah so going to weddings is difficult for me um because we always have asian food which is properly oily it's always spicy and i always think if it's that spicy how are kids having it but then I realized that my level of spiciness, like I just can't handle anything now because I don't eat it. Um, but what I tend to do is I usually take like a breakfast bar or something with me, uh, a couple of them, just in case I can't have much of the food. 
Um, but usually at least I can have like plain rice. So any, I, won't, I won't starve, but yeah, it, it's hard with our function. Um, and alongside like the tiredness and everything that goes along with it, like you need food to have energy to be at our functions, don't you? Because they're quite long. Yeah. <laughs> Nanda, how far do you think we are from normalizing these conditions and other conditions within our community? Because you've obviously been on a journey um, and you're still on, on this journey. But just from being in it and your experience, how far do you think we are? Hmm. I don't know. That's a tough question. Um, I think it's better. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to sort of split it up into generations. So if I'm talking about the older generations, like my parents' generation, sort of above sixty or so, um, I think social media has a big influence on whether we accept these kind of conditions and what to do with people that have them and how to help them and stuff. So usually that age bracket isn't on social media so I'm not sure there has been that much of a change um, and the only change that there would be is if they've had someone in their family with these kind of conditions and they've, they've kind of understood them so I find when I speak to older generations it, they'll only understand it if they've had experience of it with somebody else or if they've had it themselves um, with younger than 60 they I think because we've been a bit more open on social media about mental health and like chronic condition, chronic illnesses, I think it's starting to change now, which is really, really good. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of social media, but that's one of the biggest things that have changed. I think mental health in itself, just being a bit more, you know, people are a bit more aware of it. They know what it means to have issues with mental health and how a chronic illness isn't just physical, there's a lot of mental health side to it as well. I think we're definitely heading in the right direction. Yeah, that's brilliant to hear because um, obviously, I know you mentioned about social media and the generations as well. Um, because <clears throat> we've still got a long way to go. So would you, I mean, I know you're probably gonna say social media to me, but what do you think that we as this current generation can do um, to kind of speed it along a little bit more or just change. Uh, I, I don't know if we would be able to change the older generations thinking about it, but um, just generally in terms of just speeding it along a bit more, um, making more people aware, uh, things like that. Yeah, so yeah, I would definitely say social media because I mean, that's where everyone looks at, isn't it? Um, but other than that, I would say anyone that's got an illness um, or, or has had difficulty with mental health or anything, just just talk about it just be open um and I think like even for me before I went on social media and told everyone um the more I'm I'm open about it it just in random scenarios like if I go to a wedding and I randomly start talking to someone the, one of the first things I say is oh I've got colitis and once I start talking about it they're like oh yeah I know somebody with it or or I've had these issues myself blah 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 and I think just being open and honest with how you're feeling and what you go through on a day-to-day -day basis really, really helps other people. And I think that's what helped me when I first got diagnosed, I looked to other people. So at that time, I didn't have a lot of people in person that had similar conditions to me. I had to look online. But in that time, we didn't really have like, we had Facebook, but people weren't open on Facebook. So I went to forums um, where I would talk to others that had my condition and just talking and understanding that you're not alone. I think that's the biggest thing. So now I would say that just be open with whatever you have. No one's gonna judge you. And what you'll actually find is that there are so many others that, others that are like you and you'll feel so much better knowing that you're not alone and other people go through similar things as you. Ooh, that's brilliant. Um, is there any like three things that you'd suggest uh, for someone who's suffering for something similar to what you are going through, uh, what you've kind of been through? Um, maybe if they're just starting out, um, what the three top things that they could do and where they could go for help if they needed it? And then, yeah. Yeah. So my top three things. So the first thing would probably be to talk, tell someone um, whether 
that's someone that's really close to you or someone completely random, just opening up, even if you're opening up to a stranger, it really gives you that confidence and that boost that I've, I've let something out because a lot of it is you're holding all of it in. So just talk. And if that means that, you know, if you can't talk to your family or your friends, then look for someone that you can talk to that is a stranger. So you're looking at sort of therapy. And therapy isn't a scary word. It's just, you know, it just helps you to talk and get things out. You don't have to have an issue or a problem to go to therapy. It just helps you to kind of get your feelings out and put your feelings into words, which really helps you to understand yourself and what's going on inside your body. Um, number two would be to look to either other people that have other illnesses and speak to them or go online have a look at forums or social media I mean social media is so easy to find now I mean you can search on Instagram what your illness is and you'll find so many um, profiles to follow with a person that has the same illness as you so doing that will give you some confidence and a bit of guidance as to what they're doing to help themselves and maybe you can try those things as well and the third thing is one of my biggest things whatever condition you have whatever illness it doesn't matter I think doing some sort of mindfulness or meditation or just taking time out in your day to just sit quietly and just look into yourself and kind of feel like what what are you feeling listen to what you need and I think the more you kind of take time to practice mindfulness or meditation or just sitting in silence for a couple of minutes a day, the more you will become in tune to what your body needs and what you need to do and what your next step is. Sometimes that can just be, oh, I feel sad. I need to speak to someone or, you know, I need to go for a walk. Just little things like that is it's stopping the stress and the craziness around you and just taking a step back and just listening to what you need. That's it. My top three. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Nanda. Um, there's a lot of that you've discussed here. Um, so we'd like to thank you for your time today. And uh, we'll uh, share this out. And if there's any questions that anyone has, um, we'll tag you guys, tag you in the um, our Instagram TVs as well. And then the, they can reach out to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome.